are now rocking with the best. Malik Davis, your financial credit guru, the hit maker, the score. Malik D, your financial credit guru, the hit maker, the score. Fox O's number one financial literacy podcast. Today, I have my co-host, Mr. Dan Green, tax accountant slash economist. And today, our special guest, Mr. John Gathers. Hi, what's going on with you guys? Pretty good. How about yourself, good brother? Another day in paradise. Small business valuation. What is that? <laughs> small business valuation is the transfer of wealth that all small business owners talk about but never really realize. So when you think about the asset value of your home, mm -hmm. you get an appraisal on your home. When you think about the asset value of the car you're buying, somebody's appraised that car. They assess that value. How many business owners do you know who actually have had their businesses appraised? Not many as I know of, because, hell, my yeah. business, my, even my business is not appraised, but I know I make the money. Small business valuation is how you actually get the money if you determine that you want to sell your business or even transfer it to your children. Wow. So you actually, you, what it is that you do, and I want my black and brown community, my viewers and listeners to really tune in to this discussion and this topic because this is one of these discussions and topics that you really, really need to wrap your head around to know how much your business is worth if you go try to sell your business. And when you're dealing with our businesses and our communities, a lot of them don't even know the value of their businesses. Yeah, what would be some of the mechanics in terms of de determining, say, I've got to four Wendy's mm. and I've been operating for 10 years and they've been profitable. Mm -hmm. So if what would come into the determination, what would be the players? Who would be the players? Sure. And say, if I want to sell my business, uh, I'm looking at selling it now. It's been profitable for 10 years and I want to sell it. So what would I do in terms of determining the value mm -hmm. coming to an appraised value right. before I negotiate that sale? So let's start high level for the people okay. who are not, familiar with valuation um so when you think about building the asset as a business right you start with a wendy's mm -hmm. and you build the asset value of that franchise and now you're the number one number two wendy's in your area great job now how do we capture that how do you actually get proof and value from what you've built you spent your hard-earned time on mm -hmm. the first step that i like to start with is called benchmarking Mm -hmm. So how does your Wendy's compare to every other Wendy's in your state? How does your Wendy's, the Wendy's that you own, compare to every other Wendy's in your town? Are you the top producer in your town? Are you the top producer in your state? If we determine that you are, then guess what? Automatically bumps your evaluation up. And how did you determine that? So there are records that can be pulled. Um, one of the biggest one is Ibis World. Um, another big one is Profit Sense. All banks, all financial institutions, business has been done in America for three, four hundred years. I mean, they know the data. They know what a good performing construction company should look like. So it's based off data. Correct. Gotcha. You got to be able to capture the data for your industry. Then you look at where you stack in your industry. Once we know where you stack, how good is your management team? How good are your numbers? All those things compared to your industry. If you're in the top 5% of your industry, automatically boost your valuation to the top percentages of that industry. Now, is that nationally or locally? You're terming it locally. It, it, it usually ends up being locally. It depends on what type of business that you have. So let's say you have a construction company and you're already doing business on a national level, then now you can benchmark yourself against other national construction companies. If you're a construction company that's doing regional, then now you're just going to benchmark yourself against the regional companies. It depends on your business's footprint and how you want to scale the data and the benchmark for your valuation. Now, the problem that I think I see with our community is we don't have this conversation. Yeah. So let's let's start from the top real quick, okay? Mm -hmm. Just to kind of give you a little bit of data. Um, and when you look at businesses, transfer of wealth. You want to leave your businesses to your kids. Mm -hmm. Our community loves to say that. Here's the reality: only 18 percent of businesses are actually successfully transferred to the next generation. Why is that? Great question. The number one reason is because most kids don't want the business. 
I watch mom and daddy slave and bust they hunt for this business. And they can, wander through the resources. Oh, man, they can front in front of you. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, they look good in front of you. Nice house, mm-hmm. big car. I watch that, all the days that they didn't come home at night. Well, yeah. That's definitely true. I heard the arguments. I heard the stresses. So it's very hard to get the kids to actually want the business. I've got some clients, successful businesses, and their clients and their kids don't want to have anything to do with it. Don't want to touch it. Really? No. They give it to they they give it to a stranger. Yeah. They have to. Or sell. someone that worked for them for quite some time in their business. They don't even want to work with the parents. They don't even want to start in the business. They don't want to have anything to do with the business. Rather than not not long term, they don't even want to come to work for dad. A mom. Mm. And Dan, you just touched on the second biggest one. I don't want to work with family. They're disinterested. I want to do it my way. Mom and dad is going to want to do it their way. You know, they're used to this set way. I want to bring about changes. The ri- mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very messy working with family businesses. It can get very ugly. We've had clients who've had to fire their own children. After they, they gave them the business and the kids were running in the ground. Had to mm-hmm. turn back and fire the kids and they go to things. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot that's of these. Typical. That's yeah. typical. Yeah. How do we, how do you determine to when an individual is trying to sell their business what that business is really worth? I know you said something sure. about when Dan had answered you, you know, asked you the question, you said is that in, you said international or national or whatever? Well, locally, nationally, yeah, regionally. Yeah, yeah. How did you determine? I know you said it's based off data, mm-hmm. but within that data, how did you actually determine to the key number? of what that business is worth once that person is trying to sell that business. I know it's based off data, sure, but what are the moving parts? Yep, let's get into the weeds. So um, it's more art than science, Okay. but the steps typically become how is the business structured, number one, because a lot of people have four or five million dollar businesses that are sole proprietorships. Mm-hmm. You can't evaluate a sole proprietor. If he dies, the business dies. That's right. all to it. So how is the business structured? Number two, what are the business's contracts and relationships? Mm -hmm. If the business is on the last leg of 10-year contracts, that business is less valuable than the business on the first leg Mm -hmm. of 10-year contracts. Makes sense. The the, Another thing that you want to look at is always the financial position of the business. How do you run? How much cash do you keep inside of the business? How lean have you kept your debt? And how many assets does the business actually own? Because you have a lot of businesses that actually own houses, businesses that own real estate, businesses that own other businesses. What we'll do is we'll determine all the weight of all those assets, and then we'll come up with a number that says, okay, well, based on your financial position, your contract position, your management team being in place, they're going to stay around. Last but not least, the assets that the business has, we assess your business is about $800,000, a $1 million, whatever that number may be. Now, the truth is the average businesses in America only sell for about $300,000. That's it? Yeah. That's the that's, average business. That's a small business. That's the average small business in America. And the average small business only sells for $300,000, which is nothing in this economy that we in right now. That's 100% correct. Yep. So a lot of people wow. who try to typically start a business, I usually tell them, have you bought a house yet? Well, if you hadn't bought a house, take that good credit and buy a business. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So give us some examples. I mean, give us some stories. Sure. I want to I hear some because, you know, you're dealing with the small business, I mean, small business valuation. And I want to know some of the things that you have experienced in your profession Dealing with these small business, when people go to try to sell these small businesses and they only value at $300,000. Mm. So I had a, um, a client of mine who had a high profile business. Everybody knew them, you know, wonderful, been in magazines, I mean, extremely famous. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the business, looked at the assets, looked at the way they structured the business, looked at the contract value, looked at the financials, and I was like, your business is only worth $800,000. And I was talking about upset, on fire, didn't believe me. But I just thought you said the average business only sells for $300,000. Well, how did we get to the eight? So their business is a little bit above average because of the size and the scope of their contracts. And they actually had some really decent sized federal contracts. Yeah. The, the truth of the matter is the business wasn't transferable. Gotcha. That's what hurt them. So... When you think about that, being able the to, contracts weren't transferred. That's a, that's one hundred percent correct, and a lot of the relationships weren't. 
So when you think about buying a house and buying a car, those are transactional. Very easy to determine that if I move out, you can move in if the house isn't damaged. Um, there's the car still running. If I give you the title, it's your car. You can drive it. Those are very easily, very transferable assets. Mm -hmm. A business is a little bit more tricky because you spent 15, 20 years building the relationships that make your business run. The customers know you. Mm -hmm. They don't know your kids. Right. Is that the term you know? goodwill? That is the term goodwill. <laughs> that is the term goodwill, mm -hmm. along with the brand that you've built. If you look at your reputation. Let's take a score, quick commercial break so we can pay these bills. And we're going to jump right back into this. There you go. Malik D, your financial credit guru. Welcome back to the school, Financial Literacy Podcast with Fox. So let's get back into talking about the goodwill part as we were discussing before we went to this commercial break. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So when you think about goodwill, right, it's the determination of the intangible assets of your business. The word Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. the brand and the logo are probably worth more than the actual business. Now, you better explain the difference between tangible and intangible. <laughs> yeah, because we got to make sure our viewers <laughs> yes, and listeners sir. are very yes, in tune and, and they catch up to what it is that you're talking about. Because sometimes conversations that we have and vocabulary that we use, and it goes over a lot of people's heads. Fair enough. Um, so when you think about the truck that you use to pick up the load that you're going to deliver mm -hmm. to the Coca-Cola station, to the delivery station. Mm -hmm. That's a tangible asset. I can physically touch this truck. Right. I can pick the soda cans up off of the back of it. Those are tangible assets. That's how I'm making my money. The intangible asset is the brand Coca-Cola itself. People actually walk in the store and look for the logo of Coca-Cola to determine they're going to purchase that. Mm. People walk into the T-Mobile store and look for the Apple iPhone. Right. Don't even know what model it is, most of them. They just want it because it's Apple. It's Apple. Those intangible assets add tremendous value to your business. So they have to have those, they have to have some assets that's really, really, really have a number attached to it to, to determine that if they sold their business, those assets would carry whatever it is that they're trying to sell to like get the what brand, they need. Like the brand like Nike. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That that's your goodwill. Another part of your goodwill is your management team. That's how Warren Buffett makes his decision. That's how I do a lot of my valuation. I, if you have a young, vibrant, talented management team that plans to really, really ramp your business up and they lay out the plan to me, yeah. I'll give you a higher valuation. Now, a management team is what you pay them. That's actually not an asset for you. You got to pay your management team. But when you look at what they bring that are intangibles, their the value, ideas, their the thoughts, value the that. value of that, that's goodwill. Is that a tedious process that you have to go through? <laughs> it's very tedious. A lot of moving parts. Because you're talking about numbers. You're talking about your valuations. You're talking about worth. Right. You're talking about many different elements and components that go along with what it is to make your decision or you give the decision as to how much this business is really, really worth. It is a lot, a lot of moving parts, a lot, a lot of work. The good thing about it is if that a business is very, very straightforward and if they're in a straightforward industry, it's a lot easier to give them evaluation versus like a tech industry. So when I say a straightforward industry, trucking, construction, mm -hmm. things that have been around for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. the data is so driven, it's so focused, it's so narrow. I can look at another construction company that is your size. I can see what they sold for in the last two or three years mm -hmm. and I can get really, really close to a number based on that. If you just came out with a new technology, let's say Calendly. Calendly got evaluated at a billion dollars. What's the name again? Calendly. Calendly. Yeah, the brother's actually from here. It's a brother's calendar app. I actually use it. Mm. And it's a, it's a technology that allows me to send you a link, and you can look at my whole calendar and schedule a meeting with me whenever I'm open. We don't Man. have to discuss opening times. Without now, even communicating with you. We don't have to communicate. I can send you a link. You can press a date on my calendar and book a time. That is, man, that's brilliant. Now, with these, <laughs> now with these companies, now with these mm. businesses that people are trying to sell, what mm. if they have actually ran into some type of tax issues? Mm. Are you able to see that as well, too? Yes. Because everything is based off data. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. We do look at the public record, and we do see if, 
you're pending a bankruptcy, if you have tax issues, you have to look into the owner because the owner carries a certain amount of the asset value of the business. So you also consult with his accountant and his attorney and yes. all that? Yes, we make sure that their accountants, their attorneys are all a part of the valuation process to give us the data that we need and to hold them yeah. accountable to what we find. Because a lot of times business owners aren't really happy with learning that their you know $20 million business in their mind is only worth two. 300,000, 800,000. And that could be something like a street business. Correct. Correct. A lot of business owners are shocked when they figure out how much it's really worth. How many, t when you look in a public and a closely held company, which is what you're dealing with, you're mm -hmm. not dealing with publicly held companies. You're dealing. So when you come across a business, how often do you see that they actually have their financials audited by? Outside That's a great firm, question. Which you rarely probably see, right? Um. So he here's the thing. Let's tranche it, right? So I love middle market companies. Um, I, I ran a middle market company, okay. and middle market is just defined by companies who bust that $30 million mark. They call you the lower middle market, then you get into the 50 to 100, mm -hmm. then you get the 100 to 500, 100 to 200. Those are middle market companies. They, they're big to me and you, but to publicly traded companies, we buy you. You know, you guys are kids to us. I deal with what they call the upper main street companies. So those are the businesses that can go from one to thirty million. If you're a oh, one really? million dollar business a year to a thirty million dollar business a year, more than likely they're gonna. That's that. Those are the businesses that are more than likely they're gonna sell. Those are the small businesses that get sold the most. That's the best value you're gonna be able to get for your business because somebody bigger, some a fifty million dollar business, Look is gonna buy a ten million dollar business. Why should I expand into your state when I can just buy your business? Right. So, how many people? have you seen within the last year of 2022 that have wanting to sell their businesses but then came back with a low ball number? Great question. Most businesses do not have their financials in order. 80% <laughs> of the businesses that I touch, the financials are in order. Most business owners want to sell, but the finances are not in order. So what COVID did, COVID pushed the last bastion of great business owners out of the mm -hmm. door. 85% of your... And it was your, designed to be that way, too. I mean, I know we had a pandemic, sure. but at the same time, that's that, that's that's a planned situation as well to drive a lot of these small businesses out of business. Me and Dan have had numerous conversations, and you warned me, and I can remember to this day, you said, Malik, if certain parties take over the, and certain parties get elected and things like that, you can kiss small businesses goodbye. Mm, mm. Yeah. You remember but those I, conversations? That's happening now. Oh, it's okay. definitely happening right now. Yeah. 30 million, um, the one to 30 million, the upper Main Street, 85% of those are baby boomers. Mm. They were going to retire until yeah, COVID all, happened. Yeah. They, were, they, they call it the silver wave. They were gonna, they, those business owners are going to walk away, mm. whether the kids wanted it or not. When COVID happened, a lot of those business owners got the uh-oh of their lives because they realized, oh, wait a minute, I can't even sell my business. Mm. A lot of business owners tried to sell 2020, 2021, and even now, and they realized the business was not prepared to sell. If I was an individual that wanted to buy any of these, you know, corporations or either these businesses, how much does it really cost to get out here and buy these businesses? So when you look when at a lot of these people don't even have all their proper finances sure. together and things like that, can I still get it? So that's a little bit that's that's a really strategic question, but it's a really good one. Mm. And the reason it's a good question is because what most people don't carry into factor is that if you're the business owner, Dan, and you're the guy who wants to buy the business, right? You're the mm -hmm. private equity firm. Mm -hmm. Um Dan's business is five million dollars. Yep. Now it may be five million dollars to people on the street, but to Dan, that five million dollar business may bring him a hundred a year. 85% mm. of the value of Dan's businesses is locked in the business. He can't touch it until he sells it. That five million business ain't worth five million dollars until he sells it. That's what most it's small not value that five million until he sells it. He can't touch the cash. He can't realize his life's work until he sells the business. Mm. What most small business owners think is that they're going to start a small business. It's going to get up to five million dollars, and they're going to make five hundred thousand dollars a year. The cash flow from the business is usually far less than the sale of the business. Plus, well, you have to factor in the debt load they have, too, right? You have to factor in the debt load. And if you're thinking about taking over a business, three things that I tell people to look at. How much debt does the business have? 
How much money do they plan to pull out of the business? And do you have to pay full value up front? Is the owner going to allow you to sell a finance? Mm. If it's a $5 million business and Dan pulls out all the cash when he sells, which <laughs> is what most people are going to do, mm -hmm. they're going to take the cash. That means you need to pay Dan's value. You got to have enough money to refill the cash that he took out of the business. Mm -hmm. So if it's a $5 million business, you may need to come up with about $8 million to run the business after you buy it. Wow. So you're going to pay Dan his five, and you're going to need three to run the business after you pay him his five. That's crazy. Yeah, there's a lot of factors involved. And that's why it's so important for our people who are especially in that baby boomer generation. If the kids don't want it, you need to make sure your business is ready to be sold. Mm. Instead of, I mean, instead of just, let, just letting it go. Succession planning and exit planning are the things that we don't talk about enough. So when they just let their business go, they don't have anyone to sell it to. They just, the business just belly up or either can the state come in and get it? So it, a lot of times what they'll do is if they've had a really good, loyal bunch of, you know, employees, mm -hmm. they'll they're actually structured to where the employees can actually buy them out. And a structure, an employee, a structured employee buyout can be one of the most beneficial things for the business owner because they know how to run the business. They've been there with you. You trust them. And the business owner still gets his big chunk of cash coming from the business because they are using the profits to pay off the debt of the sale. Mm. So that's another strategy our people just don't know about. Let's take a quick commercial break so we can pay these bills. We're going to jump back into this. 10-4. Malik D, welcome back to the School of Financial Literacy Podcast. John, if I wanted to sell my business, what would be the most that I can get, the most bang for my buck, and what do I need to have put in the property? What do you, how do you need to structure to prepare for the sale to maximize your profit? Mm, mm, man. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. So that is the question that I hear the most nowadays. Um, and... The truth of the matter is you need to plan for about three to five years before you leave your business in what is called succession planning mm. or exit planning. Both can be the same thing. Because a lot of people build businesses up just to sell them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, smart people do. Um, so when you think about that, if you're looking at the plan that you have laid out for your business and you're looking at the lifestyle that you want to lead when you leave your business, mm -hmm. you can model that. I mean, you can literally go five years into the future and lay out every step that you need to be living in Tahiti if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the first step of year one, let's say that you actually want to move to the Bahamas and yeah. you want to live in the Bahamas for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. We're going to go, OK, cool. How much money does that take? What type of investments do you need to make sure that you can live in the Bahamas, not have to work again? So we'll stuff your, you know, small business 401k. We'll get your traditional 401k. We may even have to look at getting you a, a structured trust or some annuities like, you know, life insurance. You know what I mean? Like getting your alert. If we learn that that's what you need and let's say you need $5 million in that to make it work, then we're going to structure your business to be sold for $5 million. The beginning of that typically looks like how do I now start pulling back? So who in my team can be the new me? Mm. Because Lord knows. There ain't going to be any of them kids. Man, listen, most small business owners can make about $60,000 a year for making 80 hours a week of work. Think about that. It's hard work. It's very hard to be a small business owner, and most guys can't take them hands off the reins. So the yeah. first thing we tell you is fire yourself. Find somebody who can do the job that you're currently doing for the business. But if people are so dedicated and so committed to a certain type of way of running their businesses and they go out here looking for someone to run their business the way they normally run their business, it's going to be very hard for that to, tra to transpire that way. A hundred percent correct. Great point. So what I tell you is I don't need you to find another Magic Johnson. I don't need you to find another LeBron James. You don't need to find another Michael Jordan. You need to find a Scottie Pippen. Find somebody who can do 80% of what you can do. Mm. Now that gives you 80% free time, 20% to focus on the other 20% that they can't cover. Mm -hmm. Don't look for somebody to replace you 100 for 100. Get somebody that can do 80% of what you can do. They just That's good enough. That uh, begs another question. Um, if you've got, say, partners, 
and you both have equal value in the company, and mm-hmm. you both rely on each other. Now, of course, if you lose one of them, it would be devastating to the company. There are financial uh, arrangements you can set up, sure. Products you have also that you could that will soften the blow of losing a partner, right? You might want to go into that because so, that kind of leads right into. What you, so it, that's an actually great point in succession planning, right? So if you look at the next step, if you do have partners. Um, Key man life insurance is going to be something that you guys have to put in place. Key man life insurance? What is so, key man life insurance? Key man life insurance is to say that me and you are 50-50 partners in the business, mm-hmm. and we're both running the business together, and you pass. That's a financial hit to the business. Yeah, Our customers could be worried. It needs to be covered. Employees can be worried. So how are we going to fill that gap financially? It's got to be covered. Key man life insurance fills the gap, the economic impact that you have in your business. So let's say your value to the business is worth a million dollars. Key man life insurance will pay out a million dollars for the business. Wow. Not to your family. To the business. To the business. To carry your partner over. To carry us over for you, to find somebody to either replace you or handle the fallout from losing you. Very important part of succession plan. That's a good point, Dan. The next part that you want to go into, after you figure out who the management team is, now number two, what is my new role? How yeah. do I drive contract value? How do I how do I feed the beast to pump it up full of good structured contracts that I know that the person who buys this business can operate without me? Mm. Lord knows, don't let the contract be something only you know as the owner. That's what a lot of owners do. They get really? fixated. Oh my God, so many owners that if they walk away from that business, it's there's, over. No, there's no more business. So you have to think about how do I structure the next wave of inflow into my business, the contract value, Mm -hmm. to be transferable. That's point two. Last but not least, point three is what happens to the money that's in the business when I get paid? So let's say I've got $100 million Mm -hmm. sitting inside of my business. Mm -hmm. That's the cash value of my business. I got to keep this cash in it to run the business. Absolutely. When you buy my business... How much of that do I actually get to take home? Once we determine what that is, we roll that into the sale of the business and we help you meet your number. So if you want to sell your business for maximum value, Mm. those are just three of the key things that we try to focus on. And then we move you through the path of completing the task to get those things done. Getting back to the key man uh, policies and stuff. What if like, you know, that same scenario, except with in this situation, uh, I don't want to deal with my partner's wife or his son. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure they, they're they taken care of, but I don't want them involved in the business if my partner dies. Yes, sir. How can I address that? Yes, sir. Great question. So what we'll typically do if there are multiple owners and we don't see an operating agreement in place, operating agreement goes in place before the key man life insurance. What are the shares? Who owns what? It's the prenup for your business. I don't care if you're the best of friends, blood brothers, cousins, husband, and wife. Mm. You need to have an operating agreement inside of your business. Even if you're a single owner, you should have an operating agreement because it determines what your role is. How do I know you're actually doing your job? So what are your goals? Mm. How are those laid out? What are the key performances for the business? How are we supposed to be thinking about our roles? How do our roles evolve and change? What happens if we don't do our job? What happens if one of us dies? All that's typically laid out in the operating agreement so we know what happens in the event that somebody leaves the business. So when you look at a business and you assess in a business when a, when you, when, when a person is trying to sell the business, what sparks your attention as far as assets that this person has with his business when they're selling this business is to determine how much you're going to actually alert this person when they're selling this business or to tell this person you can get this. Exactly. Um, so the thing that gets me going is really the intangible side of the business. Good financials. Good core business, great team, everybody's working. You got long-term contracts. The customers ain't going nowhere. They love you. You got good relationships with the team. And then all of a sudden, I see that everybody in the town respects you. Everybody, Mm -hmm. every single person that when they wear that T-shirt and they go out in the Walmart, they got a sense of pride on them. You know, the, the people love your brand. They love your company. Then I look at the things that your company has that no other company has. You have a process and a delivery method that no other company in the industry has. That one intangible asset could put your valuation $10 million. Easy. Wow. Easy. 
Now, do loans play a factor in that as far as the data that you're getting on these businesses? Now, do, I mean, if, if an individual has, has taken out a lot of loans to fund their business, does that play a, a factor in the data too? Huge factor, brother. Huge. Because the problem with loans is that most people won't transfer the debt. So if you buy the business, you got to pay for all the loans right up front the day of the sale. Really? Yeah. yeah. Banks don't want to give that liability up. I got you. I got Malik D on the hook. I don't have this new owner on the hook. Yeah, liquidate the debt. It's just got to liquidate the debt. That will kill a business valuation. It's just like, it's like when you're selling a house. And that you factors live. in the, the price of the of the of the of the business. It does. The value it's it has to be a, clear, gonna... free, free and clear of any type of. Any type of debt. Just like if you were merging with a company and you assume the debt, mm -hmm. that's going to affect. You're not going to uh, emerge on Wall Street. It, it changes your valuation debt. number significantly because yeah. if you're carrying a lot of debt in your company, that's more money I got to come out of pocket before I buy you. Exactly. So if I'm really interested in the company, I'm going to push your valuation number if I'm the buyer. I'm going to go, nah, I can't give you five million. You already got three million worth of debt. I give you two and clear all your debt. Yeah. That's the way. Now you got a lot of individuals out here that's buying these shell and shelf corporations and stuff like that. I mean, they selling these shells and shelf corporations, these businesses out here, and they stating that these businesses are free and clear of debt. <laughs> they have no um, um, any taxes or tax liens associated with these businesses, as far as debt or whatever. When they selling these shell and shelf corporations. Can you break that down to me a little bit? I mean, do, do, sure. do you deal with that as well? So I've seen people spend nineteen hundred, nineteen thousand, two thousand, eighty. I want to make sure I ask you the right question. Oh no, 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 no! I, I've seen people spend a, a numerous amount of money on shelf corporations, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen maybe one shelf corporation actually turned into a viable business. Wow! Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because when people see a shelf corporation, so you mean you've been operating all these years? Where's the core business? Where are the employee records? Mm -hmm. It's something Let's take called a quick commercial break. We're gonna pay these bills. We're gonna jump back into this. Welcome back to the School of Financial Literacy Podcast with Fox. So, John, let's get back into talking about these shells and shelf corporations because it's a lot of hooking and crooking going on <laughs> with these shell and shelf corporations with these people selling these businesses out here, and they paperwork ain't straight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, um, worst case I've seen, I, I just talking to it. They're going to be mad about me, but we're going to talk about it. We're going to keep it honest. Uh, guy spent 80 grand. And they spending that type of money out here getting lined up too. Eighty grand corporate guy, um, yeah. you know, wanted to shortcut some of the pains of small business, and uh, went in to get some things structured from his business. I don't want to say what industry he was in, but he was actually in a pretty good industry. Mm -hmm. The business would have been pretty successful if he had done it a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so he had some corporate relationships. He was rolling everything out to get his distribution started. And people go, how have you been in business five years? We don't have any employee records. Wow. First thing the bank asks. Yeah. You've been in business five years, no employee, no payroll taxes. What, what have you been doing? How did you make this amount of money in five years? You've been paying taxes by yourself, and then, you know, we had to give him some language to say and kind of help him finesse it. I won't say that out loud because I don't yeah. want to, yeah, I don't want anybody reusing this. But um, there's some Things that you can do to help a shelf corporation come alive, mm -hmm. but you need to spend one year running it with a traditional business standpoint behind it. So you either are going to need to be running it as a trucking company for a year, running it as a distribution company for a year, running it as a studio podcast for a year. You need a real business to roll. So that's almost shelf. like starting a new business. It, Technically, so it, it is. And and the problem is, is that when people think they're going to shortcut the work of running a business, when they start to buy a shelf corporation, they're yeah. fooling themselves. Wow. You're going to have to run a real business inside of the shell. Now, if you had a real business and you, you know, got some debt, got some beat up, you know, got a little beat up during COVID, needed to transfer the real business into a different asset, that's when you would use a shelf corporation. You kind of wipe the slate clean a little bit. But they but say, you, but they say it come age, and it, they, they say it comes age, and it comes season, and things like that. You know what? If we, I'm gonna skip that topic right now. <laughs> let me tell you why. Why? I don't want to, to to tell people things that end up inciting fraud. 
because I, there's a I, lot I, of fraudulent activity. A lot of people buying shelf companies to get PPP loans. Wow. A lot. Of, I know guys who who are going to they're facing federal charges right now mm. um, because he did four million dollars of PPP loans and shelf companies. So by them, so so basically he tried to get nickel no dime way. slick. Yeah. So basically he tried to get nickel dime slick. <laughs> went out here and bought a shell shelf corporation that's supposed to be aged and seasoned, and believe. went out here and ran a jokes with the PPP loans. So imagine if I walked up to you, PPP, and I'm telling you, look. You're going to give me 60 grand, but I'm going to do all the work for you. All I need is your name, your social, and you just need to sign this paperwork. Mm. I'm going to give you 60 grand. Now, you done got the cousin 60 grand. You done got the mother-in-law 60 grand. Everybody ranting and raving about you in the church. <laughs> they love you. Everybody tired Go of see that. Go see yeah, Satchel, Exactly. Sats. The pastor's so happy he don't know what to do. Church ain't never seen that type of money. My God. <laughs> so, you know, preaching sermons, boy, like he Martin Luther King reborn. Don't see such and such and such and such. Now, imagine if somebody actually gave you that deal. You flat broke, never really ran a business before, don't know any better. Mm. And somebody was like, all you got to do is give me 60 grand back. I'm going to get you 140. I'm going to get you 200. Just give me 60. And Cat was out here killing him. And that- but he, but he ran out there and got a shelf corporation. Went out there and got the shelf corporations, rolled you up in it, said you had XYZ trucking company for four years. Mm-hmm. You went out and leased mm-hmm. a couple of trucks. You were running them, and then COVID hit. Pretty slick. Mm-hmm. So uh, until, until the feds caught him, you know what I mean? Wasn't bad. So they out here running jokes with these shell and shelf corporations by saying they aged and seasoned. All the taxes is up to date with the shell and shelf corporation. And they even got these dummy financials to go along with these shell and shelf corporations just to run jokes. Yep. And they ran it. They ran a lot. Um, but it wasn't, you know, again, our community wasn't the biggest frauds in that one now. Oh, really? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> no it's, it's, it's our counterparts and, you know, people overseas actually yeah. ran some. PPP. Yeah. PPP was, I mean, chi- the Chinese probably took about $80 million of PPP money easy. Some people estimate it's in the billions. You even had people in federal prison. Correct. And then and, and, and you had convicts getting loans. Yeah. That is, that's 100% correct. Hmm. But now, now. Oh, another they were doing tr- PPP jokes in, in prison? They was doing all kinds of stuff. They were getting that, and they were getting the stimulus checks. It was, yeah, yeah, I know about the stimulus. Yeah, checks. but they were getting loans too. Now the and worst the EIDL loans. The worst, the worst truth in our community, though, in my opinion, was forty um, percent of minority-owned businesses, brothers, African-American-owned businesses, went under because they didn't pay taxes, so they couldn't get PPP and they couldn't qualify for idle. That's forty percent. A minority business. So you you very reversed in that area, dealing with the SBA as well too. So um, my day role is I actually work as the regional director for small business development in South Carolina, SBDC, mm. and I actually work on the historic campus of South Carolina State University. Oh really? Yeah, I'm a product of HBCU. I went right next door to Claflin, so I got two of the biggest and oldest HBCUs. Orangeburg, right there in Orangeburg, South Carolina. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Corridor shame, baby. Uh, one of the poorest areas in the country. Mm. Uh, some of the worst education in the country. That's why I commend you for doing this, guys. You you guys don't even know how empowering this is. You know what I mean? Like, you really are empowering people. So so you deal with the student loan aspect of it, too, right? The financial aid and all of that, too? So what I try to do around that one is I try to tell students the honest-to-God truth is Financial literacy outside of your education is just as important as the traditional education. Mm. Making sure they listen to podcasts like The Score, making sure that they're tapping into their own personal financial situation, and making sure they understand what is really an asset, how to build asset value, and they live below their means for a certain amount of time. Mm. Um, so I do, we do have a lot of financial literacy conversations, but I stay in the small business wheelhouse. Uh, I run my division. I want that to be one of the biggest minority centers in the country. And I want us to be known as one of the greatest groups that led the first statewide disparity study in South Carolina. South Carolina needs a disparity study more than any other state, I think, poor. in the country. Very poor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to find out the root of the problem, how bad the problem is before we try to fix the problem. Yeah. Do you think a lot of it is cultural? It is. Um, you're, South Carolina, if you can do a study on what hopelessness does to the human brain, South Carolina would be ground zero. Um, when people lose hope or, you know, if people sit and shit for too long, it mm-hmm. stops smelling. Mm-hmm. 
South Carolina has had black people who've been sitting in their own crap a little too long and it stopped smelling. They've just gotten used to being at the bottom. Get immune to it. Don't fight. Don't push. Don't even go after the things that are set aside for them. We'll throw events. Black people won't even show up. The event is for you. They looking for you. I got to pull guys into events. But we're changing that. You know what I mean? We're working on that. And I look at my father's generation, look at my grandfather's generation. I see how it became that way. I've talked to, sen- to excuse me, a couple of senators. Congressman Clyburn gave me the best really? conversation I've ever had about how South Carolina became the way it is now. And now I know it's just, hey, look, if you recognize a problem, if God gave you the ability to recognize a problem, God gave you the ability to solve it. So I just want to be a part of the solution down there, man. And uh, again, I commend you, brothers, for what you're doing because this is definitely solution-oriented thinking. So, uh, but Dan, back to your question, man. I, I, listen, if small business owners had really, really good financials and understood their financial position, then the number of small businesses that are sold in America would quadruple. Because people really do have great businesses. The problem is guys like you don't have the information they need to prove it to guys like me. If somebody gives you bad data, what can you do with it? Can't do C- nothing with it. You know what I mean? As a CPA, what could you do with shoebox receipts and, 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 and you know, years and years and you of missing data? tell them every year. <laughs> Set up an accounting system. Nope. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yep. Now they're so in, they're so into their businesses, running their businesses, and whatever they are doing, mm-hmm. you know, their vocation, but they don't understand the aspects of having an accounting system, mm-hmm. a, a simple bookkeeping system, so you can keep up with your cash flow. And then they'll get up with you every quarter, or whatever. Well, how much do I owe? Do yep. I need to send any money in, yep. or whatever? And then I said, well, let me see your books. So, <laughs> what did they give you? Your, their checkbooks. Yep. And receipts and invoices kills you it it kills your valuation because that kills your business how in the world do i know how much your business is worth when i can't even see how you how much you've been making last three years you don't have your financials in order it kills small businesses every single time not paying taxes or lying about how much you made on your taxes man i had a, a Mm, almost said the name. I had a company. <laughs> <laughs> I had a company that um, had a million dollar loan. Mm. Now they have a business that does eight million dollars a year, and Lord knows I'm proud of them because I've seen them. I watched it come up. This is a real business owner. A lot of people fake business ownership. Yeah, this one's real. Let's take a quick commercial break so we can pay these bills. But we're gonna jump back in because I want to. I'm eager to hear about this. <laughs> got you. Got you. <laughs> Malik D, welcome back to the School of Financial Literacy Podcast with Fox Soul. Let's continue this conversation, Mr. John, in regards of what we left off at. So the taxes are crucial Mm -hmm. to lending. When you lie about your taxes so you can circumvent the tax obligation that you have, Mm -hmm. you kill your ability to be able to raise capital. Because you make it look like you've made less money mm-hmm. or that your business, it, it carries a lot more expenses than it does. So you can't meet my debt coverage ratio. If your debt is too high in your business, if, if your cost of goods sold is too high in your business, then how can you pay for my loan? You're telling me that you have a million dollar business, but it's cost you $999,000 to run it. Mm. I can't give you a loan based on those. I mean, that, don't lie about your taxes. I had a... A situation with a client, $8 million business, raised a million dollars and could have raised $2 million to do exactly what they should be doing with wow. their business. But because they, you know, inflated numbers mm-hmm. and the accountant was in on it. Wow. You know, they couldn't raise the money they should to run your business. So it's a short term trade off for a long term impact. So it's very small minded thinking to think that circumventing taxes actually helps your business. It really doesn't. It kills you. And that's why I'll, that's why Dan always state, pay the people, pay them, pay them, pay them, pay your taxes, so you can show that the company is bringing in the revenue, the income. That you have a viable company. Exactly, exactly. Because sooner or later, you're gonna get audited. <laughs> oh, and they're cracking down on that now. Yes, Lord. But that's for the next episode. <laughs> yeah, we won't get into that now. We'll do that later. So, uh, I have another question. Uh, you know, when you're talking about 
businesses, uh, acquiring businesses, uh, starting businesses. If you, if I came to you and asked you that question, what kind of answer would you give me? What answer would you give me? Is it better to acquire an existing business or to start? A, is it better to start a business? Um, my opinion is going to be a thousand percent. Go buy somebody else's business before you start a business. And I'll give you three quick reasons. Yeah. Number one, someone's already proved that the business model works. Hmm. Everybody comes up with these great ideas, but if they haven't been proven and hadn't made a dime, doesn't matter how original it is. If you don't have customers, you don't have a business. Number two, somebody has already learned the painful lessons for you. All the mistakes that they made, all the oops moments that they made, you get the benefit of having that person already take the headaches and the bumps and bruises inside of that industry. Last but not least, if you're smart, you can actually have the person who started and who has been running that business stay on for 18 months to mm. teach you how to run the business, mm. to guarantee your success. Nine out of 10 businesses fail on the startup side. 70% of businesses that are acquired run for an additional five years. Mm. Doesn't mean it's going to be guaranteed success, but right. you got about a five year window. Because it's already been proven. Because it's already been proven. So wow. just doing the That's numbers, baby. Sense. Yeah, just doing of. the numbers. The numbers say if you if you take over somebody else's business, you have a much more successful experience in entrepreneurship than if you start a business. That's a great question. Now, one of the most interesting things that I think I've been seeing on campus. So our HBCUs are really starting to step up the game. Okay. Um, and one of the things I've been hypercritical is that HBCUs don't do a lot of community engagement. Why? So typically the HBCUs are a universe that's internal. Mm -hmm. If you went to this school, you get all the school's resources. We give you everything. That, if you didn't go to this school, you know what I mean? We hmm. turn a blind eye to you. The communities that HBCUs sit in could be an incredible opportunity for HBCUs to incubate businesses. A lot of incubate a lot of a lot of HBCUs could incubate businesses around staff involvement. Students who know social media can help a lot of small businesses with marketing. Mm -hmm. Students who actually need real world experience can be taught how to do underwriting. We're working with that right now at South Carolina State. Mm -hmm. Another good thing that I think South Carolina State is also doing is they're putting on seminars. Oh, really? I actually participated in a seminar with some of the top um, intellectual property lawyers in the country. Now, in these seminars and in these meetings that they're having, are they having a discussion about credit? So they're not necessarily talking about financial literacy in the way that they should. They bring out outside vendors, and I would love to make some inroads there for you. Mm -hmm. That's actually on my to-do list. I'm glad you Good. brought that up. Good. Um, That's so an important piece. What they're thinking about doing is technology transfer. Okay. So if you look at MIT, Stanford, Harvard, where Facebook was created, if you look at LED lights that are above our heads right now, mm -hmm. that started at Cree University. So Cree, Cree, Cree started at North Carolina State University. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, let me get my math, mm -hmm. let me get my mind correct. Mm -hmm. That's a technology transfer. So three engineers came together and they said, we got this great idea for light bulbs. And the school said, okay, show us. Wow, these things are so much brighter than traditional light bulbs. This is great technology. Mm -hmm. What do you plan on doing with it? And the student said, I don't know. Now, the HBCUs in the past would have been like, eh, we don't know what to do with it. Yeah. What North Carolina State did, they went and put those lights in the middle of their stadium for the biggest game of the year, NC State versus UNC, the big rivalry game. <laughs> so when people walked out to that stadium in the middle of the night, and they're like, it looked like daylight out here. Cree Lights took off, became the number one LED company in the country. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that probably makes about $100 million in donations from North Carolina State through a technology transfer. If your college helps incubate your idea and your technology, then they can get a piece of the ownership that allows the college to grow and use that money to help more students. Hence, that's why you had the intellectual lawyers. 
That's what we had the intellectual lawyer session about. HBCUs are starting to catch up. I'm proud of the way that they're trying to engage with the community, but they do need to do a little bit more on the credit and helping people on the financial literacy side. I agree a thousand percent because a lot of people go into these HBCUs, a lot of people go into these colleges, and they come out in debt, and they need to understand the importance of credit, the understanding the importance of credit, debt-to-income ratio, credit utilization, et cetera, when it's credit-related in those colleges. I agree with you. Uh, when I started college um, in the early 2000s before they passed the law, on the way to the admissions office, they had the credit card companies lined up. Ooh. And these were high interest, you know what I'm saying, very low limit credit cards. Mm. And they would just tell you, hey, man, fill out for the credit card. You're going to get approved no matter how bad your credit is. It doesn't matter what your credit score mm-hmm. is. We're going to give you the credit card. Mm-hmm. And guess what? All you have to do is wait till you get your refund check and just pay the credit card debt off. With a high interest rate. With a very low utilization, you know what I mean? And they're not giving them no type of financial literacy when it comes down to this credit in these colleges. (laughs) You really, really need to push for that. We need to get together so we can really implement some type of financial literacy when it comes down to this credit and the credit building processes and how to utilize credit inside of these HBCUs, John. I will agree with that, man, and and that would be— an entire ecosystem because you have to push that to small business owners as well. A lot of times we're doing evaluation work. We realize that small business owners have been working for 25 years, no savings, no retirement plan. Mm. Credit has, you know, either been repaired or is on the ropes of being repaired because they use their personal credit to start a business. They didn't have any business credit. They didn't yeah. know anything about it. That's typical. And, Small businesses. And no. now, you know, now it's time to retire. I've been doing this for 25, 30 years. It's time to step away. And they have no method of stepping away. My viewers and my listeners, how can they get in contact with you in regards of, you know, these individuals that's wanting to sell their, these small business owners that's wanting to sell their businesses and things like that? What's the contact for my um, for my viewers and my listeners to get in contact with you? Sure. My most active form of social media is LinkedIn and Instagram. It's going to be John B. Gathers. So that's John B. as in boy, G-E-T-H-E-R-S. Um, JohnBGethers.com or you can reach out to me on the company's website that is Diamond Standard Capital. Diamond Standard Capital. Diamond. But John, great episode with the School of Financial Literacy Podcast. Thank you for having we me. We definitely want to get you back on here because I think it's so much more that my viewers and listeners need to gather from this conversation that we're having. But a pleasure to have you on the School of Financial Literacy Podcast. And with that, peace out.